Hello and welcome to watching Left, Right and Centre, the weekend edition and our big focus on the show this evening. Less than 10 days to go for the Jammu and Kashmir Assembly elections and terrorism is at the centre of the poll discourse with militancy far from over both in Jammu and the valley. A day after Home Minister Amit Shah reiterated the no terror for talks refrain in Jammu, the Defence Minister campaigning just kilometres away from the line of control which witnessed heavy gun firing just weeks ago hinted at a possibility of a dialogue with Pakistan only if it stops aiding terrorists. From snubbing Pakistan's SEO invite to calling Pakistan a proxy war agent, the Prime Minister has minced no words in his diplomatic position vis-à-vis -vis Pakistan. The government has been clear. Terror and talks cannot go together. But with Southeast Asia turning more volatile than ever before, a peaceful neighbourhood is India's immediate concern. The onus, however, for peace is on Pakistan, is on those backing militancy. On left, right and centre this weekend, we ask, as India's Defence Minister opens a door for dialogue, will Pakistan walk the distance? Before I bring in my guests, listen in to what the Defence Minister had to say. पाकिस्तान से बातचीत करने की बात कुछ लोग करते हैं मैं कहता हूं पाकिस्तान एक काम कर दे आतंकवाद का सहारा लेना बंद कर दे कौन नहीं चाहेगा कि हमारे पड़ोसी देशों के साथ रिश्ते बेहतर हों क्योंकि इस हकीकत को मैं जानता हूं बहनों भाइयों जिंदगी में दोस्त बदल जाते हैं लेकिन पड़ोसी नहीं बदलता है and joining me on the show this evening, I'm being joined by Shazia Ilmi, spokesperson of the BJP. Also with me, Prabhu Dayal, former ambassador and a very articulate voice on India's diplomacy. Dr. Dara Karta, former director, National Security Council Secretariat, will also be joining us on the show this evening. And I'll also be joined by spokespersons from the PDP and the National Conference. Going across to you first, uh, Mr. Prabhu Dayal, how do you see what the Defence Minister has said today? He's, of course, reiterated what has been uh, the government's stand, that terror and talks cannot go together. But he's also hinted at some sort of a conditional dialogue with Pakistan, something that perhaps the government has largely been opposed to uh, in the past few years. I think that the Defence Minister has given very good advice to Pakistan. But the unfortunate thing is that the Pakistan army will not stop supporting terrorist activities against India. The Pakistan army rules the roost in their country. Pakistan is not a democracy where the elected government calls the shots. Rather, it is a deep state. And in the deep state, an unelected authority calls the shots. In the case of Pakistan, it is the army alongside its intelligence wing, the ISI. Now, Within Pakistan, the army derives a lot of importance by saying that India is hostile. The Pakistan army derives mileage because of the hostility within them. Now, if there's peace, the army will have to go back to the barracks and it will lose its prestige, its importance and its overall say in their political system. So, while the Pakistan army does not want an open all-out war with India, because it will pay a very heavy price. It did so in Kargil. All along, uh, the Pakistan government pretended that their army was not involved. But very recently, uh, General Asim Munir, the chief of the Pakistan army, has acknowledged that Pakistan lost a lot of soldiers in Kargil and that their army was involved. Now, the army does not want an open conflict. It wants um, covert warfare. It wants to send terrorists to India to retain the hostile nature of the relationship. And for this reason, Pakistan has been ceaselessly supporting terrorist activities against India. Mm. I'm afraid that will not stop because if it stops, the importance of the Pakistan army within their country comes down. Imran Nabidar of the National Conference is also with us. Uh, Imran, your response to what Rajnath Singh has said. Uh, the regional parties in Jammu and Kashmir, of course, have talked about dialogue being the only solution. But I'm afraid in the past decade or so, perhaps more than the decade, we haven't really seen any lasting solution uh, to the Pakistan problem. Given the fact that the central government is open to conditional dialogue only, only on the condition and the caveat that Pakistan needs to stop aiding terrorists. That's a fair diplomatic position. Would you agree? Uh, exactly. I think it's a silver lining and uh, we welcome it. 
this is a very positive development that has come after a very pretty long time as uh, all of you must be aware that national conference has always been a votary of uh, reconciliation uh, a, a votary of dialogue because we believe that every issue and every uh, uh, conflict uh, can get resolved by only dialogue uh, gun is not a solution uh, we have seen um, enough of bloodshed and it's a very welcome uh, sign that uh, the indian home uh, defense minister has made uh, a very positive statement uh, vis a vis dialogue and he has sort of um, uh, justified our stance also because we have been uh, uh, our leadership has also always um, uh, uh, been a big votary of this dialogue uh, now uh, the the ball lies in the court of pakistan and I, i'm sure they also need to uh, make a step and they also need to send out some signals and uh, i think i'm sure that uh, somebody in the pakistan administration would uh, uh, you know would also like to uh, have cordial relations with with india and this is a positive development we welcome it very important point you are making that this is a positive development and also you know this conversation is happening in the backdrop of of course uh, the elections that are scheduled to be held on the 8th, from the 18th of september so important there that the national conference there welcoming uh, what rajnath singh uh, has said on this um, shahzia ilmi a quick response uh, to this and also the larger question around um, india's stand vis-a-vis -vis pakistan of course the uh, defense minister also reiterated the terror and talks cannot go together stand but do you see this also as some sort of a softening of position as far as pakistan is concerned in the run up to the elections i don't see any softening there there is of course a need to underline and specify that we would want good relations with all our neighbors and because he specifically did mention that while we do not uh, choose uh, while we choose our friends we don't choose our neighbors and that is extremely desirable for india to have good relations and to initiate a dialogue but it cannot happen uh, with the uh, with the stance uh, 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 and the existence of uh, sponsored terrorism that uh, india has been at the receiving end of for years so that is made am amply clear if you look at national conference they are keen that there has to be a, a dialogue with pakistan that is important to the relations and to the interest of valley they have also reiterated that they would be very lenient to uh, the prisoners with uh, who have serious charges whether sedition or others mm. or, and also and also uh, on uh, trade loc trade and talks of that now talks trade do not go together with terror mm. so now it cannot be a parallel track in that sense so it is it one happens at the at the expense of another and that is exactly so, so Shaya, what are you saying in a sense that what the position of the regional parties vis-a-vis -vis pakistan has been uh, perhaps that of unconditional dialogue and that is a problem are you saying that well absolutely it's a huge problem and this is of course this is a political compulsion of uh, the two parties uh, prominent parties of the valley but uh, bjp which very clearly has stood for something like abrogation of 370 and 35a which has a manifesto completely uh, dedicated to this and who we've had a whole history ideologically if you see how shama prasad mukherjee um, lost his life and how he, he was uh, he died in very mysterious circumstances and how the whole party and ideologues and what it stands for is completely for an integrated uh, in a uh, 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 jammu and kashmir in every sense of the word okay. that is legally so that's an important constitutionally point you made. and particularly the socially political and compulsions and let me get the national conference spokesperson to respond to that imran your response to what shazia is saying that there are perhaps political compulsions and some sort of a tight rope there for you which is why you need to emphasize uh, again and again on this kind of unconditional dialogue with pakistan despite the fact that uh, you know we see rising cases of militancy no there is only one compulsion which uh, bjp doesn't understand which uh, perhaps uh, their leadership doesn't understand is that uh, at the end of the day the conflict has uh, taken a heavy toll on kashmiris uh, 
One lakh people have died. That is the compulsion that we have. That is the compulsion. That is the pressing need that we want. That both these countries should sit together and discuss the issues on the table rather than fighting with guns and bombs. That is the compulsion we have because we have lost over one lakh people to this senseless violence, and and we don't want to lose more people. We don't want bloodshed. So it is it is prudent, and I I think it's a very welcome. Statement okay. from the uh, the defense minister who has who has who has sort of uh, uh, the 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 kind of statements that that has come from uh, the defense minister is very encouraging when he said that we cannot change uh, our neighbors uh, we can change our friends but neighbors are there which uh, late Vajpayee ji had also said yes so uh, it's it's a uh, I would I would call it a very positive development, and it is something okay. that uh, both countries need to take forward. And I said it but, earlier. But the also, point you made about rising militancy and Shazia, come in on this quickly before I get in Dr. Tara Karta listening very patiently. So Shazia, I mean, uh, the BJP has constantly made this point that militancy has gone down uh, since the revocation of Article 370. In fact, in your manifesto, you talk about complete eradication of militancy. But the fact of the matter is that we have seen, particularly in the past six to eight months, the kind of uh, terror attacks, whether it was an army vehicle being attacked, whether it was an IEF convoy being attacked, uh, the ambushes that we've seen across uh, Jammu and Kashmir, both in the valley as well as Jammu. So militancy is far from over. We'll have to accept that. And nobody's even saying that. In fact, in all the speeches of Amit Shah Ji, the Home Minister and all the records that are there for everybody to see, uh, the fact of the matter is that in terms of the incidents of terror and death uh, that happen of civilians uh, and instances of militancy, it has gone down by 70% and that's a huge number. When you look at something like stone pelting, which was something that everybody saw and experienced and suffered and uh, was part of, it has come down by 100%. If you look at tourism itself, I mean, we're looking at huge numbers there. And uh, that is that is big. I mean, come on. So mm -hmm. I, I, it's like maximum tourism has happened in this phase. And not just that, we've seen panchayat elections. We've seen Zilla elections. We've seen DDC elections, which have not happened. And we've seen a huge turnout. So in that sense, it is actually the end of freedom of these three political parties, but sovereignty and autonomy for the mm. local Kashmiri in mm. the valley for the very first time. And it has never ever happened before. I would in also fact, like in to fact the turnout that we saw during the Lok Sabha polls as well, that was also quite uh, encouraging. Uh, though, of course, yes. uh, many, many, uh, those within the electorate have pointed out that the situation is more complex than that. While, of course, there's been increased autonomy and the economy has opened up, but there are complexities that need to be addressed. Dr. Tara Karta, from a diplomat's perspective, um, you know, what should be the way forward when it comes to our you know, relations with Pakistan. Do you see uh, the government stand that there cannot be any talks as long as Pakistan continues to back terror? Do you see this as, uh, the, you know, the solution for lasting peace? Because we do need a peaceful neighborhood. We are seeing what's happening in our neighborhood. I, in that sense, I don't think the government position has changed very much. I mean, yes. that's what we've been saying, that, you know, as long as terrorism continues, no talks. And you had Jay Shankar. Hmm. who recently said the same thing. I mean, he said, look, we will respond according to what Pakistan does. And if Pakistan carries terrorist attacks, I'm sorry, we're not talking to you. Nobody should talk at the point of a gun. I mean, that is something which most countries will refuse to do that, you know, if you increase terrorist attacks, I will talk to you. Sorry, that is hmm. not a happening thing. Yes. And second thing is, I think the Article 370 is a given. That is what the government says. And if in that perspective, any talking to Pakistan on that is also not a, is not likely to happen. Hmm. And it should not. You made a decision, you stick with it. Having said that, if Pakistan responds to us, like Nawaz Sharif had said, I mean, he said that, look, you know, we we had we actually violated the the Lahore agreement, you know, we did. So there was that encouraging kind of talk, but right now. You, whom do we talk to? I mean, Asim Munir, Lieutenant General, General Asim Munir is the top dog. Mm -hmm. He's got his own ISI chief in, in custody. He's going to get the next, I'm pretty sure, this is not a full stop. He's going to get the last COS on as well. So there's chaos in Pakistan. 
and economically they are in decline they are suffering severe rise in terrorism mm. all of which means pakistan should stop supporting terror and talk to us mm. that's Even the best many people have described terrorism as uh, frankenstein's monster uh, you know when it comes to pakistan uh, but ambassador dayal uh, one point that dr tarak karta made that you know when we speak of dialogue who do we really talk to i mean it's not just the uh, government in pakistan but the military establishment really uh, that calls the shot so this dialogue uh, with pakistan that has become the sort of focus of uh, you know the poll narrative as well is extremely complex and i'm i'm sure as a diplomat you would agree with that well i agree with what dr tarakar has said and in fact in my opening remarks i also categorically stated that the real power in pakistan rests with the army yes it is the army which calls the shot and whenever the civil in leadership has tried to do something other than what the army wants the civil in leadership has had to pay a price i recall that uh, zeol haq had executed uh, uh bhutto then later uh um uh, musharraf had overthrown uh, nawaz sharif recently imran khan is languishing in prison because he dared to question the authority of the army chief general asim munir so it's the army which calls the shots and the civil and leadership has to play second fiddle and as i said the army profits from a hostile relationship with yes. india it derives prestige it, it tries to pretend to be the the protector of pakistan mm. and in the bargain it sets up lots of advantages for itself there are army housing societies defense housing societies which yes. are given to army officers at throw away prices there is the fauji foundation where retired army officers are employed and he gets gets huge emoluments so the army has to uh, maintain this relationship of hostility because it profits from it mm. and that's very important point i think i'm making because that's really the, the, really the essence of the entire debate and you know we've seen in the past 2 uh, 3 years particularly so many instances of how the military establishment in pakistan is really profiting uh, from from this t- t- terror industry as uh, many of our government ministers have also called uh, but quickly let me get in a political spokesperson on why this has become a political plank in fact imran if you could come in on this we saw your leader leaders of the pdp also talking about how uh, you know the the militancy and how the entire security situation has worsened since 20 2019 but you know the larger question is why make this a political plank so why not i mean if uh, bjp can question when they were in opposition if bjp could question everything they put a, every domain politically why can't we uh, question the actions of the present government and why can't we use it politically what stops us from using it? because at the end of the day this is what democracy is all about i mean right now the uh, the government at the center and, and 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 in jammu and kashmir it is the bjp which is calling the shots and we need to ask questions they need to be held accountable there have been n number of uh, incidents in 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 the valley which deserve some sort of answers i mean many of our soldiers have died in the line of duty who is responsible for that i mean there has to be some sort of accountability and we would not uh stop uh, asking questions we would question the government we would question it is the job of the opposition this is what makes uh, a democracy vibrant and this mm. is what makes a democracy uh, uh working okay shaza your quick response to that so i think first of all i feel uh, national conference is in a bit of a spot if you know what happened in the last elections and i think uh, uh, umar abdullah has been rather traumatized by his uh, defeat at the hands of uh, engineer rashid's um, uh, in his hands and how he lost his uh, uh, you know how he got rejected by the populists so to speak which is and he also promised that he would never 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 be a part of any electoral transaction so to speak if until uh, it becomes until jnk is gets statehood back but there you have umar abdullah begging for his honor taking off his cap petrified to the core uh, going helter skelter and fighting from two constituencies not just that ever since amit shah uh, made his presence felt and released the manifesto and made it amply clear that there is no return of 370 and 35a and that it's gone for good uh, you see how how uh, cleverly and mischievously 
he mm. brought in that is umar abdullah brought in um, um you know the whole matter of uh, um afzal guru so here we looking at, and and this causes a lot of embarrassment to his alliance partner because congress ministers do not know what to say mm. so when you want to talk politically and you want to cater to the lowest basic sentiment which is exactly what is doing talking about you know the the communal card the victim card afzal guru imagine using a a a, a, a convict uh, a, you know like afzal guru to further your political gains so i understand what my friend says from nc that you have right. to do everything to put to make it political but having to resort to using afzal guru's name to get some gains for yourself i don't see it as a shot in the arm at all i do okay. see it as a shooting yourself in the foot it's the other way around and right. i do not the, the think it's now see debate of course uh, is an entirely different debate but i said uh, shahzeh i'll, I'll have to cut you short i'm running out of time uh, dr tarak karta the last word to you a uh, two part question a how do we really change the situation on the ground whether it's through dialogue or uh, you know the kind of policy india has adopted the situation on the ground remains grim as many have pointed out and also do you think uh, polls perhaps can usher in uh you know a new era for jammu and kashmir particularly when it comes to uh militancy yeah i think a transparent polls which is what we are seeing now is what is actually needed for jammu and kashmir i mean if you got engineer rashid actually contesting you've got a, a relative of these i mean there's a lot of jamaat e islami has killed yes. a number of people this is a transparent election which nobody can question that is actually what you need on the ground however if i can just say one thing i would be, i mean ideally like it if regional parties did, i mean you talk of everything but don't bring up this issue of talking to pakistan that it is an issue of foreign policy you know it is not uh, Okay, I agree with you so, uh, uh, that perhaps that that really shouldn't be brought in in the poll narrative. Shahzeh, you had a point. Last twenty seconds, yeah. No, I totally object to uh, Ma'am's uh, insinuation that there that there is lack of transparency. I don't know what she's insinuating. No, no. In fact, she's that. saying that there is there is transparency. There is no, That's what no, she is saying that we no are seeing transparent polls there. Uh, but I'm afraid I'll have to leave it there. We're running out of time on left, right, and center. This, of course, remains one of our top focus stories. on ndtv given the fact that uh, polls uh, will begin in jammu and kashmir on september the 18th a truly historic moment a turning point for the union territory for now a sh uh, short break but news continues on the other side